he can follow a life of virtue, symbolised by the woman with the book and sword, who stands in front of a long, winding path that leads to the castle perched on top of the mountain in the background. The sheen on the knight's armour and the distant blue hills are thoroughly Paraginesque. But in the Ansidae altarpiece, made in 1505, the figures occupy their space in a far more convincing and satisfying manner than Perugino had ever been able to achieve. The geometry of the composition is carefully planned out, in thirds, vertically and horizontally. There are still some problems in the design. If the throne were constructed as Raphael has painted it here, it would have been too shallow to sit on comfortably. Even so, he was able to improve on the design by Perugino on which the painting is based. Raphael transforms Perugino's heavy marble throne into a more graceful structure. He also gives his saints more animation, and perhaps more significantly, the potential for animation. We really feel that both St John the Baptist and St Nicholas could freely move about within the space, and are not, like the saints in Perugino, apparently frozen in their poses. And the precisely balanced architecture that Raphael has invented here provides a structure within which the figures can come to life. But the most important moment in the young Raphael's artistic development came when he went to Florence, which is where he would encounter the work of Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci. He had with him a letter of recommendation from Giovanna Feltria, the Duke of Urbino's sister. The bearer of these will be Raphael, painter of Urbino, who, being gifted in his profession, has determined to spend some time in Florence in order to learn. And because his father, of whom I was very fond, was most worthy, and the son is a most sensible and well-mannered young man, on both accounts I bear him great love and desire him to attain perfection. To attain this perfection, Raphael knew that he needed to study at first hand the work of his two great older contemporaries, Michelangelo and Leonardo. In Florence, both artists had been commissioned to paint frescoes depicting battle scenes for the council hall inside the Palazzo Vecchio. Neither of these works were completed and are now both lost, but their compositions are known to us from copies. Michelangelo and Leonardo both used drawing to develop their ideas. This greatly interested Raphael, and is surely one reason why he was so keen to visit the city. One of Leonardo da Vinci's most celebrated paintings was his composition of Leda and the Swan. The lost original is now known to us through copies such as this one. Raphael made his own study of Leonardo's work, resulting in this drawing. He has ignored the mysterious, suggestive landscape and the charged erotic atmosphere of Leonardo to concentrate instead on the figure's contrapposto pose. Her weight is supported on her right leg, giving her hip a graceful curve that is counterpointed by the twist of her upper body as her shoulder skews through space towards us. This rhythmic articulation of the figure was a great lesson to Raphael, his galatea of around five years later being just one beneficiary. And this beautiful panel of St Catherine, made in 1507 or 8, has that same complex movement. Raphael also adapted Leonardo's graphic technique of making rapid experimental sketches with a flurry of lines that show new ideas being tried, with heads, limbs, drapery shifted around in various positions. Studying work such as this helped Raphael to develop his own compositional experiments. When Raphael arrived in Florence, Michelangelo's statue of David had recently been installed outside the Palazzo Vecchio. This drawing by Raphael shows him perhaps working from a life model who had been directed to take up the pose of Michelangelo's monumental creation. The detailing of the muscles and tendons seem hardly drawn directly from the marble sculpture, but the inclusion of the little tree stump shows how interested Raphael was in Michelangelo and how much he realised that he could learn from him. What seems so extraordinary about Raphael is that in the course of this artistic journey of his, he is able to absorb such a series of other influences, taking on board other artist styles really very quickly and very easily, and then absorbing them into his own style, and they come out as something else. And that something else is a new, original, and wholly unprecedented talent. We can see how Raphael's drawing style evolves after his experiences in Florence. 
His figures show greater expression. They are stronger and more animated, and he is now even more assured and creative in developing his ideas. A remarkable survival is a series of drawings that Raphael made for this painting, showing the entombment of Christ. Raphael's original idea was to have the dead Christ laid out on the ground, but he soon decided to make the grieving mourners lift the lifeless body. This adds a powerful sense of effort, drama and emotional tension to the group. The figures in this study must have been drawn from life, with the models lifting weights so that Raphael could investigate the ways their bodies responded. And this remarkable drawing shows Raphael's desire to understand the underlying anatomy. He has actually drawn the figure's skeleton. And here, in this drawing, which is actually a copy of Raphael's lost original, he twists the foreground figure through space as she attempts to support the swooning virgin. The finished painting demonstrates how much Raphael has learned from Leonardo and Michelangelo. He was now ready to define his own unique contribution to the history of art. His great opportunity came to him in 1508, with the commission from Pope Julius to paint the Stanza della Segnatura, his private library in the Vatican. Such was Raphael's enthusiasm to begin that he left unfinished a significant commission of an altarpiece in Florence, but Julius was not the sort of man who liked to be kept waiting. Raphael was now more than ready for this challenge. The frescoes in the Stanza della Segnatura demonstrate extraordinary subtleties of composition, as his arrangement of the theologians and philosophers in the fresco known as the Disputa reveals. The drawings he made for this wall include examples of different graphic techniques. He worked with both nude and draped figures as he devised a complex multi-figure composition of rhythm, grace and elegance. These drawings, including an amazing sheet from Frankfurt where all the figures are studied nude, show how Raphael develop the composition, moving figures around, studying them as a group and individually, and generally putting an amazing effort of design into the creation of this masterpiece. In the centre of the composition is the Holy Trinity. Christ sits in glory and displays his wounds. He is flanked by his mother Mary and St John the Baptist and is surrounded by the heads of cherubim. Above him is God the Father, and below him, in the traditional form of a dove, is the Holy Spirit. Golden rays descend onto the sacrament that is displayed upon the altar. On the banks of clouds are seated different saints, together with Old Testament prophets and patriarchs. Amongst others, we can see St. Peter, seated at the end. Next to him is Adam. And here, clutching the tablets on which are written the Ten Commandments, is Moses, and at the very end of the row, St. Paul. Below, on earth, the fathers of the church sit beside the altar. On the left, Saints Gregory and Jerome, and on the right, Augustine and Ambrose. Other theologians and philosophers complete the crowd, including Dante, a highly suitable subject for a library, and the late Pope Sixtus IV, Julius II's uncle. They are not disputing, as the mistranslated traditional title erroneously implies, but affirming the mystery of the Holy Eucharist. The most celebrated and arguably the most influential of Raphael's Vatican frescoes is on the adjacent wall. The School of Athens is a composition of perfect order, clarity, balance and beauty that gathers together the great philosophers of the ancient classical world. In the centre, Plato points heavenward and suggests that truth is to be found in the realm of the ideal. Next to him, Aristotle takes an opposing view, with his downturned hand emphasising his belief that truth can be discovered by studying only the real, observable world. Traditionally, it is thought that Raphael based the features of Plato on those of Leonardo da Vinci. This balding figure here represents the ancient geometrician Euclid, proving a mathematical theorem to his amazed and admiring